Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Institute of South Asian Studies panel discussion on COVID-19 impact on the Indian economy and financial sector. So before we proceed with the event, we'd like to request participants to mute your microphones throughout the session. And following the panel discussion, should you have any questions, please forward them via this chat to the moderator. The questions will be consolidated for the panelists to answer. Uh, this afternoon, we are delighted to have with us the former gov Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Dubri Subarao, and also ISS Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow and former Comptroller and Auditor General of India, Mr. Vinod Rai. And joining Dr. Subarao and Mr. Rai on the panel discussion is Dr. Amit Tendu Palit, ISS Senior Research Fellow and Lead Trade and Economics. Dr. Palit will moderate the panel discussion, and I shall now hand over the session to him. Dr. Palit, please. Good afternoon and thank you very much, uh, Jia Hao. I extend a very warm welcome on behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies. First, to our very distinguished panelists today who have already been introduced by my colleague Jia Hao, Dr. Subarao and Mr. Vinod Rai. I also take this uh, opportunity to welcome within us Chairman ISAS Ambassador Gopinath Pillai for being present with us here today. And I am equally delighted to welcome the very large number of uh, participants and registrants who have joined us for today's event. And we look forward to an extremely engaging discussion on the impact of the COVID-19 on the Indian economy, and in particular, the financial sector and the financial markets. Let me begin by uh, sharing with you some very basic information on how the COVID-19 has impacted India till now. As of yesterday, which is the 4th of June 2020, the government estimates released by India pointed to around 217,000 active confirmed COVID-19 cases in India. Now, this by any yardsticks is a fairly large number. And if one looks at the hierarchy of countries in terms of the number of infected, then India right now is at number seven. It is the country in Asia which has the highest number of infections. And needless to say, in the region where it features, that is the South Asian region, it is the country which accounts for the largest number of cases. Now, this for India has been a rather sharp transformation in the sense that uh, barely 10 weeks ago, and the time when India went into uh, what is uh, described in the Indian official parlance as lockdown, and which has also come to acquire considerable popular currency in the containment strategies taken across the world by various countries. The time when India went into a nationwide lockdown for controlling COVID-19, that was 25th of March, 2020. The number of active cases in India is very difficult to believe now. We're just a little more than 500. So today from there, there has been an extraordinarily sharp escalation in the number of cases with uh, cases doubling at an average frequency of around 11 to 12 days. But the good part is that the number of people who have actually succumbed to the infection is much less compared with those in many other countries of the world, particularly in Europe. And till now, we have just around 7,000 odd casualties that have happened around India. But this number changes each day as more and more uh, confirmed cases come in, as more and more deaths get reported. Today, India has shifted from the very stringent lockdown policies that it had implemented from the 25th of March. This lockdown went on on four phases, getting extended at different periods of time. What is now happening in India is a steady withdrawal from the very large number of restrictions which the central government and the state governments had imposed. And to the extent that the current phase of containment in India is being variously referred to as unlock 1.0, in an allusion to the previous four periods of lockdown one, two, three, and four. 
And what we are observing is that in place of a overarching macro focus on restrictions, heavily restricting economic activity and social and cultural interactions, India is gradually moving towards a policy of focused containment based on the concentration and spread of cases in specific areas, which are often as narrow as specific neighborhoods or residential areas within cities and towns. What we are also hoping to see is that as time progresses with more days going, more and more of the economy will come back to action, more and more of normalcy will be restored, of course, with certain safeguards as standard operating procedures. But in the meantime, what has happened in India first during the period of its lockdown and then even before that with the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis has actually been a cause for serious concern in terms of its economic impact. There have been a large number of estimates that have come out uh, with respect to economic impact. We will hear about those getting reflected and discussed upon in the conversation that we have. I would first like to start today's discussion by inviting Dr. Subha Rao to speak. And what I would like Dr. Rao, I'd like to request him to actually specifically look at the macroeconomic growth prospects that India faces going ahead. And this is on the back of the fact that early on in the month of April, the International Monetary Fund released its forecasts about a large number of major economies of the world. And within that group, India and China were the only two economies which were showing positive rates of growth. Uh, China at 1.2%, India at 1.9%. But since then, the situation has aggravated to the extent that even the Reserve Bank of India governor in India has accepted the fact that growth in the current year might actually slip into the negative territory. Dr. Rao, with that context, may I now kindly invite you to share your thoughts on what you foresee as the growth prospects for India and what are the challenges that it faces? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank ISS for inviting me to be on this panel. In response to your question about speaking to macroeconomic situation in India, Amit, I want to make three points. The first one about India's short-term economic prospects. The second about the limitations of fiscal and monetary policy in managing this crisis. And third, the challenge of returning India to a growth trajectory in the medium term. On the first point about the short-term economic prospects, as you've indicated, the prospects are quite grim. And as you've said, Amit, uh, the IMF, as part of its World Economic Outlook in the middle of April, released growth numbers for all the countries. Their estimated growth for India for fiscal 2021 for the current year is 1.9%. One of the only few countries to have a positive growth rate. That was in the middle of April. By the middle of May, most analysts and economists were agreed that growth in India this year is going to be negative that our, growth, our economy is actually going to contract. That's a sharp and shocking decline in expectations in just one month between mid-April and mid-May. How much negative? Most people are agreed once again that uh, it will be between minus 4 and minus 5%. That is, uh, we were going at plus 4% last year, minus 4 to minus 5% this year. That means a decline in growth of 8 to 10 percentage points in just one year. That can mean a very difficult and disruptive adjustment. Inflict pain, hardship on millions of households, millions of small and small businesses and firms, and can threaten our financial stability. Lives and livelihoods has been a very common theme in public policy discourse in this crisis. Every government battling the crisis has been confronting this dilemma. The dilemma is arguably the sharpest for India because of a weak medical infrastructure and a high population density. If we let up on prevention, millions risk losing lives. If, on the other hand, we impose a strict lockdown, millions of people risk losing livelihoods. 
It's a very difficult balance for the government to balance between lives and livelihoods. And the balance has shifted over time. Now we know that we've got to live with this pandemic for several months, perhaps several years, but we have to go on with our livelihoods. So we now reconcile to living in a low level equilibrium with this pandemic for several months or several years. As we, get, as we try to get a measure of the economic toll of the crisis on India, uh, we must remember that our economy was quite a bad shape even as we entered the crisis. Throw your mind back to January before the crisis hit us. What were we worried about? We were worried about our growth. Our growth four years ago was 8%. Three years ago, it was 7%. Two years ago, it was 6%. Last year, it was 4%. This year, negative 4%. So our growth, which is already slowing, is now stalled. We were worried about our fiscal deficits. Our central and state governments were borrowing way too much. By the time the crisis is behind us, we'll be worrying that our central and state governments are borrowing way too much. We were worried about the stress on our financial sector, about the health of our banks, the health of our non-bank finance companies, about the level of non-performing assets, about the trust deficit in some of the private sector banks. All these concerns will actually accentuate by the time the crisis is behind us on the financial sector, which was under stress, will be under deeper stress. The short-term prospects are grim. They're not just grim, they're uncertain. There are just far too many known unknowns about this crisis. When will the pandemic peak? Uh, are we having community transmission? Will we ever get herd immunity? When will we get a vaccine? When will we get a cure? Will the pandemic come back in waves? So today's situation, short-term economic prospects are not only grim, but very, very uncertain. So that takes me to my second point, which is about limitations of uh, fiscal and monetary policy in managing this crisis. Like every other country in the world, India too has deployed fiscal and monetary policy to manage the crisis. And like in most other countries, in our country too, fiscal policy has traction, but no room. Monetary policy has room, but no traction. Let me make a comment on fiscal and monetary policies. On the fiscal policy, several questions have been raised. Why is the government not spending more? Why is the government just looking on as millions of households are in distress, millions of firms and businesses are staring at bankruptcy? Why is the Atmanirbhar package, if stripped of all the packaging, at just about 1% of GDP as the government spending? Why is the government being so tight-fisted? The short answer to those questions is that the government has no regular room. The combined fiscal deficit of the central and state governments as budgeted for the current year is 6.5%. Just the loss of revenue and the decline in nominal GDP on account of the lockdown will take the fiscal deficit, the combined fiscal deficit to beyond 10% of GDP. And you put in the additional borrowing of the center and states, we're looking at a fiscal deficit in the range of 14 to 15%. That is exceedingly high. That can make our economy vulnerable to all the negative impacts of excessive fiscal deficits, like crowding of private investment, igniting inflation, pressure on our balance of payments. And all this together can dent our growth prospects. This is not just scaremongering. India has, been, has experienced all the negative impact of uh, fiscal profligacy in the past, so we should be careful. That is not to say that we should not be spending more. We should certainly spend more. And in order to finance that spending, we should be borrowing more. But I believe that we should set ourselves a limit so that the government is accountable and is efficient. And we also should be wary of market reaction. We must remember that markets are less forgiving of uh, policy excesses by emerging markets as compared to rich countries. So on the fiscal dimension, the dilemma for the government is this. Should they protect lives and livelihoods now and jeopardize medium-term growth prospects or protect medium-term growth prospects, even if that means compromising lives and livelihoods now? 
Let me shift to monetary policy. The Reserve Bank has cut rates, has injected enormous amount of liquidity, and has given regulatory forbearance. And I believe there is some logic behind what the RBI has done. Let me spend a minute on explaining that logic. Because firms and businesses, all the borrowers, have no revenue stream during the lockdown, the Reserve Bank has asked banks to extend a moratorium on loan, loan servicing till 31st of August and give regulatory forbearance on reckoning them as non-performing assets. But banks need liquidity, even if they're not getting repayments of the loan. Therefore, Reserve Bank has injected liquidity into the system. And in order to encourage lending, it has cut interest rates and has cut uh, uh, CRR rate, etc. And for specific sectors, it's targeted schemes, like for corporates, big corporates, MSMEs, non-bank finance companies, housing finance companies, mutual funds, etc. The Reserve Bank has done all this with two objectives. First, to protect financial stability, and second, to encourage banks to lend. I believe it's been successful on the first objective of preserving financial stability, but not so much on the second objective of encouraging banks to lend. Why are banks not lending today? Banks are not lending, not because the binding constraint is the interest rate, not because the binding constraint is liquidity, but because the binding constraint is risk aversion. Banks, as we know, are already saddled with the high level of non-performing assets and they're wary of taking on additional risk at a time like this. So that's the challenge of uh, uh, monetary policy, limitations of monetary policy. Now let me move on to the third point that I want to make, which is about medium term challenges. When I say medium term, I mean the next one to three years. The medium term challenge of returning the economy to a steady growth trajectory. Mind you, I said steady, I did not say a rapid growth trajectory because until two years ago, we were hoping, dreaming that the economy will grow to 8 to 10% in the future, but 8 to 10% looks like uh, not a feasible uh, option in the next one to three years. Next to one to three years, we've got to be reconciled to growth in the rate of 5 to 6%. Indeed, we should be quite happy if we get to the that level. Why do I say that? I say that because our growth prospects are going to be impacted by rising debt, by the persistent strains in the financial system, and the hesitant investment climate. On rising debt, what's the problem of rising debt? A rising debt inhibits growth and impairs investment sentiment because there'll be concerns in investors that uh, our fiscal stability and our financial stability cannot be taken for granted. The India's debt to GDP ratio, even before we entered the crisis, was 70%. 70% is quite high compared to our peer countries. Okay, Amit, so I will not move here. 70 to 70% of debt to GDP was quite a high ratio compared to our other emerging economies. Because of the high borrowing to manage this crisis, the debt to GDP ratio will go as high as 80 to 85%. No matter what metric you use, our debt GDP ratio 80 to 80, 85% can impair growth prospects. So we've got to get our debt to GDP ratio down. And mathematically speaking, that will happen if our output expands faster than our debt. But how do we make our output expand faster? Note that over the last six to seven years, our growth has come essentially from consumption, particularly from government consumption. But if indeed the government consumes, it needs to borrow more. And that's something that we're trying to prevent. So how does the government accelerate growth without at the same time borrowing more? That's the fiscal challenge. On the persistent financial sector, the NPA problem. The NPA percentage for the banks, Reserve Bank's latest figure of September 2019, was about 9 to 10% for the banking system. 
by the time this crisis is over, that's going to go way beyond. I don't have an estimate, but I've heard people say it might go to 14 to 15 percent. The NPAs of non-bank finance companies are going to be of an equal order, although we don't have a very firm estimate. 9 to 10 percent before the crisis and about 14 to 15 percent by the time the crisis is over. Which means that we're looking at the non-performing assets in our combined banking and non-banking sector of about 14 to 15 percent of GDP, excuse me, not GDP of assets. So what is to be done? I will quickly go through what I believe can be done, not so much details. The first thing to do is a one-term surgical resolution of NPAs. We can't load our infrastructure, excuse me, our bankruptcy structure framework with so many non-performing assets, the bankruptcy framework cannot cope with that. So one-term surgical operation by which uh, the, the, there is a special scheme to take over the large NPAs and the government comes out with some scheme like the top that the US had uh, adopted or implemented during the global financial crisis. That's the first thing. The second thing, there is need to recapitalize banks. We can't get away from that. And the government needs to make fiscal provision or some mechanism like recapitalization bonds, which will be a contingent fiscal liability for recapitalizing banks. Third, a bad bank. For a long time, I was against the bad bank. I resisted the idea of a bad bank, but I believe now the time has come that we should seriously be thinking about a bad bank uh, there's a rationale for that. I don't have the time to explain that, but I think we can go into that if there is, uh, if it comes up in the discussion. The fourth issue in uh, reducing the non-performing assets or handling the non-performing assets is sector-wide attention. There are some sectors, real estate, power, MSME, telecom, shipping, hospitality. All of them are more affected than other sectors. So the government has to come out, government and the banks together have to come out with specific schemes for that. So that's on rising debt, that's on uh, the NPA problem. Finally, let me make, make a comment on where is growth going to come from? We know that growth has to come from consumption or investment or net exports. We can't expect much purchase from growth in the next one to three years, neither from personal consumption or from government consumption. We can't expect much purchase from net exports given the global recession. There won't be much demand for exports. So we have to fall back on investment. And if you ask anyone, what is the one thing that the government has to do, people say it falls. It has become a stock answer. But actually, if you look at the history of the NDA government over the last six years, they have indeed done quite well over some reforms, you know, indeed very many path-breaking reforms. The uh, insolvency and the bankruptcy court, GST, the monetary policy framework, the steep reduction in corporate tax, liberalization of FDI, the agriculture uh, uh, relaxation and liberalization that were done a couple of days ago. Why is it that so many land, landmark reforms are not having attraction? My own reading is that the NDA government is seen as not being committed to reforms, taking on big reforms only when they're driven to the wall. It's, it's like they don't have a game plan, they're, they're attacking problems as they come. So what the government should do, in my view, is come out with a white paper on the reforms that they're going to implement over the next four years of this NDA two term with definite timelines, with definite deliverables, with definite milestones, so that the performance of the government can be evaluated against those milestones. And I think that will go a long way in inspiring market confidence. And the government must particularly say that over the next four years, their undivided attention will be on reviving the economy and nothing else. And importantly, in taking the reforms forward, the government must consult with the states. So my final surmise is this, 
that even though the medium term and the short term prospects are not so very bright, India's long term prospects are good. The long term India growth story is still intact. It's possible, probable, but not inevitable. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. In fact, uh, you have covered, as always, a very elaborate breadth of issues, bringing in with clarity the specific importance of the issues in the current context that we are encountering. Now, on the basis of some of the points that you mentioned, I think it's important when one looks at the Indian economy, you highlighted the set of challenges it faces. You highlighted the extreme difficulty of uh, public policy at this point in time in responding to the challenges, primarily because of the fact that the COVID-19 situation is an evolving situation. One doesn't really know whether it is ending, when it will end, whether it will come back and in what character and what kind of manifestations that will have in an extremely complex country like India. Now, on that basis, I would like to request our very other distinguished panelist, Mr. Vinod Rai, to come in. Sir, if I could, in addition to what Dr. Rao has alluded to already, he laid out the macroeconomic landscape. If I could also uh, draw your attention to the fact that the economic lockdown, or if one can say the, the greater lockdown that India brought in, was actually described uh, by various analysts as one of the most stringent lockdowns that have been implemented among the countries that have taken containment strategies. In fact, the uh, Oxford University government strategy tracker for containing COVID-19 places this among the highest on the stringency index. But on the other hand, there was also this issue that could India economically afford the lockdown in terms of the size of the economic support that it has put on the table. We have seen the economic support coming out in various stages. First, initially, when the lockdown was announced, which was primarily in terms of providing food grains and other livelihood support to the affected people. But subsequently, we have seen the description of a very elaborate package, which the finance minister and her team laid out in four or five days. <coughs> this roughly amounts to, as the prime minister had mentioned, around $266 billion or 10% of the GDP. But such a package in terms of what it is going to produce and what Dr. Rao alluded to, obviously there's a question of the economic capacity of the state and particularly its institutions, the financial institutions who ultimately will have to bear the brunt of the huge amount of resources that are flowing out. So I would be uh, delighted, sir, if given your very wide experience of having seen both the financial institution sectors and having been on the other side in the finance ministry, if you could draw attention to what exactly has been the context and what is the likely impact of the financial package that India has announced uh, and what do you foresee being the prospects for the financial sector and finally if in that context the some of the urgent reforms and new economic policies that uh, India is resorting to. Mr. Rai, please. Thank you Amitendu and thank you for giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar where we will be covering a fairly far vast gamut of activities and issues. Now, as you rightly pointed out, the government faced with a huge dilemma because the pandemic as concerning a kind of large, diverse population that India has and with the lack of medical infrastructure that we have was of unimaginable, absolutely unimaginable magnitude. Now, the issues before the government was same issues of lives and livelihood, the debate which has been going on all over the globe. Now, I think the first steps that the government did was, there was a lot of talk about, which Dr. Zubara has alluded to, whether you need to put money into the hands of the people, whether the government had the fiscal space to do that. But I think the government adopted a different uh, stance, which over the medium term seems to be working out 
or we hope it will work out because on the one hand government made an attempt to request the people to stay where they were and that government was providing rations to them food articles to them and in community centers even cooked food but considering the large population base base that we have where you have on the one hand a large number of people in the rural areas and the other hand large number of people who will are working in the unorganized sector which is largely the msme kind of sectors government decided to reach out to the maximum number of people and to try and provide them livelihood opportunities so the if I, the issue was the attempt was to devise a package which will ensure more medium term economic sustainability and not just distribute money because the issue before government was what after the first four months of what after five first five months you've taken care of livelihood or your lives immediately but after that what happens have you got enough space to be able to help them so what government did was that they devised a strategy which would a stimulus package i should say which was budgetary and non budgetary uh, 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 commitments the budgetary commitment was again as i said earlier devised in terms of making available working capital facility a uh, special liquidity facility and liquidity injection to the msmes non banking finance companies uh, discounts who were distributing electricity and i think this this sector the amount of funds provided was fairly substantial because you look at the direct assistance which was being provided as emergency working capital facility for msmes it was in the region of about 3 trillion rupees in addition to that for stressed ms uh, uh, msmes there was a subordinate debt facility of 20000 crores and another fund of funds of about 50000 crores which was substantial for the first time the government was also committed to providing direct support to the sector of ndfcs housing finance companies and that was to the extent of roughly about 75000 crore now realizing that the electricity distribution companies were in difficulty which we refer to as discoms they set apart about 90000 crores for giving to discoms also on the other hand was the issue that the people would be if they moved would be moving to um, rural areas where the amount of budgetary allocation for the manrega program the national rural development guarantee program as it's called was up enhanced by about 60% because people would be working and i think in the long term that has worked out to be uh, correct is because last year the number of people who registered for the narega pro, uh, program were 31.8 million this year the registrations are 48.9 million people so it is essential to ensure that people in the rural areas get some funds in their hands now on the non budgetary side the attempt was to bring about a combination of liquidity enhancing and reform proposals now to ensure medium term sustainability of these the package the government tried to piggy back on to the stimulus package certain reforms which had been um in, uh, in, in the back burner because of lots of other events having taken overtaken them and i think one of the uh, non budgetary uh, actions taken by government was to change the definition of uh, uh, msmes because msmes were finding it to, to be an incentive to remain dwarf because in case they grew beyond a certain level they would they ran the risk of losing the assorted government benefits that they were going to get which means you know if they grew more than if they employed more than 100 workers or worked for more than 10 years and they grew larger than that they would lose those assorted benefits government has changed that in up that by about 5 to 10 times the, the other thing was to provide 
liquidity enhancing facilities to uh, <clears throat> agriculture where uh, nabar has been given 30000 crores additional credit to kisan um, credit cards has been given given it's about 2, 2 trillion rupees has been provided for that now the reserve bank had already done a certain amount a large amount of piggy backing or, or heavy lifting by injecting liquidity for corporates and other housing finance companies and banks etc by reducing credit uh, i mean uh, lending rates so government decided that combination of these monetary and fiscal policies they had to piggy back on these for certain reforms and i think the first major reform that has been announced by government besides of course you know trying to bring about certain reforms in the financial sector where again as dr subrao alluded there has been a certain amount of risk the world averseness i would say the risk averseness is on the supply side as well as the demand side largely because of the fact that the uh, borrowing capacity was limited because of the slow growth of certain industries or manufacturing capabilities uh, the, there was no not much demand for credit on the other hand uh the capacity to intermediate household savings to industry or corporates by the banking institutions was also limited largely because of the fear of la le- legitimate credit decisions attracting investigations which was a, a, a legacy of the past government has moved in that direction also and to ensure that the slow pace of insolvency resolution is assisted they have de- amended or proposing to amend the companies act to decriminalize some of the sections on the other hand they have agreed to suspend insolvency filings for a year now if reports are to be believed there is a group of people within government which is looking at the possibility of trying to privatize some of the public sector banks how successful this policy will be i am not in a position to be able to commit just now but we are hoping that that will move now the reforms that were, were intended firstly i think punjab government took the lead to dismantle the agricultural produce marketing committees and agriculture considering the fact that the huge proportion of the population is engaged in agriculture they dismantle that so that its provisions so as to permit direct transactions between farmers and registered buyers and to ensure that they did a excellent procurement of the rabi crop directly from farmers in the current year seamlessly tying it up with the food corporation of india to ensure that food grains move to deficient states now this has been taken on by lots of other states also such that tamil nadu karnataka haryana up bihar madhya pradesh etc all have now permitted selling or produce outside as they are uh, the government platforms in warehouses cold storages etc and also government has introduced an ordinance to permit online trading for agricultural commodities in something what is known as the enam where the buyers trade directly and online the third ordinance which has been introduced by government in this direction is the amendment of the essential commodities act where cereals pulses oil seeds etc have been removed from this with the result that trade can take place and the farmers realize a better price because of this dismantling of the uh, mandis act this time most of the support price maximum amount of the support price has reached the hands of the farmers so to a large extent the unshackling of agriculture has taken place now the other was the uh, reform that government contemplated was the other factor of production which is labor and in this politically labor has been a very sensitive subject governments are loath to touch the issues because of fear of unions and political backlash but the current uh, um, year there has been a groundswell 
of attempting to bring about reforms from the states. And it must go to the credit of the government of Madhya Pradesh, which took up this first and tried to dismantle this plethora of about 150 different legislations, which are in fact quite contradictory in the application to each other. And first step to ensure that the licensing norms for contract labor is eased. They have done that very effectively and have exempted a large number of very major manufacturing uh, sectors like textile, cement, leather, iron, steel, sugar, etc. from these licensing norms with the extent that a big deal of flexibility has been introduced in the hiring and retention of labor. Another provision has been uh, in the permission to lay off laborers where government permission was required and often took a huge amount of time to lay off. It's expected that these flexibilities will be brought about because government is sensitive to the fact that new investments, new entrepreneurs wanting to come into um, manufacturing or production activities need a certain amount of flexibility in the labor laws. And this will bring about a good signal to investors. Of course, it will ensure that the welfare provisions continue. And I think uh, <clears throat> I will touch upon the last reform which uh, government seems to be wanting to introduce in terms of factors of production, which is on land. Because uh, the, to purchase land or for private entities to purchase land, they necessarily had to go through government designated entities. That could take anything up to three years. Now, it's the government of Karnataka has taken the lead to uh, permit corporates to buy directly from farmers and they need not seek permission. All that they need to do is to give notice to the district collector of the region that they propose to buy such and such land. And within one month, if the district collector has not denied them the permission, they can take it as deep permission and go forward in this. Uh, <clears throat> this will be very handy because it will ease the permissions for land use conversion also. And to a certain extent, provide clear titles to farmers or to others to who, number one, will ensure that there is not too much litigation in the entire process. And number three, which will serve to facilitate access to credit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the thought process in the minds of the government was not merely to ensure that money reaches the hands of uh, the people at large, but also the fact that money reaches through employment opportunities and through boosting up other avenues of ensuring that livelihoods can be sustained such that uh, the migrant labor at the least will not continue to be uh, in the rural areas alone. And there will be a certain attraction in requesting them or having them move to areas where they can provide a uh, fine livelihood with the combination of budgetary and non-budgetary uh, stimulus, which has been introduced by government with, of course, the reform package, piggybacking on you. I will end here. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Rai. Mr. Rai, if I could uh, stay with you on the issues that you highlighted and also in the context of the broader issues that we have already discussed, introduced by Dr. Rao. You know, uh, there has been this question of lives versus livelihoods, very central to the entire management and control of the pandemic. Uh, India is not the only country which has been afflicted by the dilemma. Countries across the world have. And uh, at some stage, as governments went around trying to protect lives, taking care of the more vulnerable sections of the population, uh, this feeling started deepening that in the process, livelihoods are being sacrificed. And probably nowhere has been that more visible in terms of the visual impact than in India, where right from the beginning of the lockdown, we had these very disturbing images 
coming up on the television and social media about thousands of migrants suddenly finding themselves out of work not knowing what awaits them being completely clueless about their conditions despite the state governments trying their best to give them ration shelter so on and so forth and then they're trudging back to their home grounds and in the process some even suffering serious casualties i wanted to uh, reflect on this in in the context of some assessments that have come out on the labor market impact of the covid-19 pandemic in india primarily out of estimates uh, prepared by the international labor organization uh, which points to the fact that countries which have very large proportions of their workforce in the informal sector are really going to be hit most hard and that's largely because of the fact that the industries which tend to engage more of the informal sector labor in terms of industries like construction housing even hospitality and garments in a number of cases are the industries which have been most badly affected by the covid-19 now what i wanted to uh, uh, listen to you from is that when we look at the financial assistance package that you uh, so so elaborately detailed out in front of us there have essentially been economic support packages i mean there has obviously been some effort in between to kick start investment recharge investment but they have primarily been economic support packages but today we encounter a situation where people have already been displaced from the jobs without any clear idea about whether they will get back their jobs at any stage and no clear idea about whether there are substitution employment opportunities available now it is not possible for the state clearly to keep supporting this people month after month what in your view is the eventual impact that one can one can visualize for a country like india out of out of covid-19 are we going to see a sharp increase in the number of people who might slip into poverty as a result of loss of jobs are we going to see more of destitution is is there really a, you know a catastrophic picture awaiting us uh i <clears throat> see the fact that a large number proportion of the population has been affected and will have to face a, a situation of as you call it destitution can hardly be denied and i think it will require a huge amount of optimism to, uh, for us to predict that they will be able to eventually get their jobs back and in very short time uh let's start from the beginning see i don't think anybody ever conceived of the fact that the migration would be of the magnitude that ultimately did come about uh what gripped the public uh, or the moving uh, migrant labor was the fear psychosis factor and they felt that it would be the cities which would be affected more by the pandemic than the rural areas so the attempt was to try and get home and save themselves because living in the cities they were living in well let's define them as hubs where they live you know in 10 by 10 rooms five people six people or possibly more so the attempt was to get back now a uh, government particularly in states have started the unlock down kind of a procedure because government realized and everybody in fact realized that you cannot keep a huge population in the lockdown for 9 weeks as we have already made that livelihoods have to be taken care of and people will have to be moving to work stations as uh, i would like to call it so already we see certain green shoots the real estate sector is reaching out to migrant labor sending them buses to get them back there was in fact today's newspaper even talked about Uh, uh, a factory in Mumbai in Chennai, which has a uh, uh, charter an aircraft to flow uh, uh, to fly 180 people uh, from Bihar into Chennai or Bangalore, wherever it was. So the reverse has commenced, but it will be very slow. But I think this reverse process will be uh, speeded up because of another sociological factor which is coming to play. 
these people who moved to the rural areas had kind of moved away from the their villages and were largely staying in the urban areas when they went back to the rural areas their acceptability within the family or in the community there was not easy so it was not so easy for them to live there survive there on narega kind of funds there were large number of other issues which are arising so now there is a sense of a reverse trend but as i said earlier this reverse trend will take some time so i would say for the next two months there will be some problems in terms of livelihoods but i think within the rural areas itself they have been well provided for for by the narega programs for accepting for the fact that it is a, a round hole in a square hole kind of situation where because these people are semi skilled painters uh, machinists plumbers electricians etc who in the narega kind of a, a, a model do not fit as unskilled workers so they themselves find it an opportunity time to start moving Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rai, for that clarification and uh, sharing your, uh, you know, the foreseeable future insight on the labor market. Let me now come back to Dr. Rao. Uh, Dr. Rao, if I could uh, draw your attention uh, to a little bit about what's going on in the Asia Pacific region, and uh, obviously the biggest elephant, unspoken elephant in the room, has always been China. Now, aside of the tensions that currently surround china in a geopolitical sense and india is also a part of that uh, there is an interesting reflection that one can share with respect to the chinese economy this was just about a week ago when the prime minister li keqing presented the work report on the chinese economy to the central committee of the parliament where uh, for the first time since china began its economic reforms this is the first year when china has not specified any growth target in gdp and this is also the last year of the 13th five year plan and the work report also sets out a very elaborate criteria of policies which would aim to make the covid-19 pandemic as an opportunity and push towards deeper structural reforms primarily in the financial sector and also with respect to long term inward fdi flows but along with that there are also several measures which are looking to strengthen the social security mechanisms and so on now what i wanted to uh, check your views on and you have been following uh, developments in china and the region closely for quite some time that i know you know is it uh, are we going to reach a situation which is valid even for a country like india to look closely at china as possibly one economy which is going to or likely to revive earlier than most other major economies and most importantly is china going to be the next most important center for global consumption when consumption across the world in major markets is likely to decline sharply what would be your reactions to that uh, thank you amit first of all i want to say that uh, i'm not as much of a china expert that uh, you said i was but since i'm an expert in answering questions that i have that i have no expertise in let me address that question yes china short term prospects i think are better than that of any major economy including that of india in in fact if there is one country that's going to have a positive growth rate this year that's going to be china and uh, as much as they've been hit by the crisis uh, they're going to come out of this much sooner than most other countries indeed they have already come out that is not to say that the chinese economy contracted for the first time in 40 years in the first quarter that is not to say the point that you made that the prime minister and the party plenary for the first time uh they have not made a growth estimate and that they are they said that they're going to focus on growth on infrastructure investment etc which is quite uh, distinct from china's priorities in the past 
So China, I believe, is going to be a growth engine for the world like it has been for the last 25 years. Uh, this crisis has hit China, crisis has hit uh, every other economy, but China still is going to be uh, the growth engine. Uh, on your question about whether China can be the source of global consumption, I'm not so sure. China can be the source of global consumption only if China allows imports into China. And I don't believe China is in a position to open, uh, is ready to open up as much as we want them to. So China wants to continue to export to the world, but not keep uh, open up any further on the imports. So China will not be a source of global consumption, will not be a source of uh, growth driver for the world economy as a whole. But China will continue to be central, I think, to furthering globalization. Uh, globalization has been a defining force in the global economy for the last 25 years. Every country rich and poor has benefited from globalization. China and Asian economies have benefited disproportionately more from globalization than other parts of the world. If there is deglobalization, every country rich and world will suffer. China and Asia will suffer more than other countries. Over the last three years, we've seen trade wars. And because of this pandemic, and because of the events over the last two, three years, we've seen the trade wars escalate and also spread into disputes on a range of other issues, including investment, security, education, Hong Kong, the origin of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. One thing that's happened as a result of this crisis is that the world has become very sensitive to its over-dependence on China. So there will be some active policy framework, active effort to reduce dependence on China. To what that translates into practice is some of the supply chains of which China was the center will move away from China. Asia, including India, will compete for them. I believe that competition is going to be good for Asia, good for India, good for China, good for the world. So far, that is good. But if indeed the world and Asia is asked to choose between China and the US, that will be a very difficult choice to make. I don't know if you've seen, but Prime Minister Singapore Lee Song Long has written in the latest edition of the Foreign Affairs magazine that Asian economies should not be forced to choose between the US and China. If indeed they're forced to choose between US and China, the prospects of the Asian century will be jeopardized. So I cannot say it any more eloquently than that. So to answer your question, to summarize what I've said over the last three minutes is that uh, China will continue to be the growth engine for the world, uh, but China will not allow open itself for consumption. Uh, China will be, be, they will be effort to reduce dependence of China to the extent that that is a positive competition, it is good for the world, to the extent that countries around the world are asked to choose between China and the US, particularly if the choice is forced in Asia, be bad for Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. If I could uh, continue with you on another, uh, uh, you know, I would say another kind of very disturbing uh, feature with respect to India in the context of the COVID-19. And this is with respect to the fact that uh, India has for several years continued to be an economy from where people have been moving to jobs. As a result of that, uh, India does have a large number of migrant workers working outside of India. A very large concentration of them are in the Middle East. And uh, we are aware of the remittances that come into India, the workers' remittances. India is the largest recipient of such remittances in the world, amounting to uh, around $80 billion annually, which is almost 3% of its GDP. Now, 
Today we encounter a situation, particularly in the southern part of India, where a large number of people who were settled in the Gulf and working there as migrant workers have come back, have returned. And this is going to make an impact on the potential inflow of remittances into the country. Now, I wanted to uh, ask for your opinion on whether you think this might have an impact on the current account of India's balance of payments and whether you see in future India or for that matter, this group of workers who have been engaged outside finding it difficult to actually go back to the kind of work they are doing because for all that we know, COVID-19 might completely change the way businesses function, projects operate and countries impose requirements on movement of labor. So that's where it would be wonderful to have your thoughts. Uh, thank you very much. You know, mathematically speaking, if indeed remittances go down, they will have an impact on the current account. They will have, they'll have an impact in the short term. And if the remittances decline is a structural trend, it will have an impact in the long term. But let's get to the numbers that you've spoken about. Yes, India has been the recipient of the highest amount of remittances in the world, about $80 billion. I've seen a World Bank report saying that remittances are going, are going to drop by about 25% this year, including into India. So we're looking at a drop of about 25% of about $80 billion. So we're looking at something like 60 to $62 billion this year. Remittances come from, like you said, the Gulf countries. They also come from which countries, the US, UK, and Europe, Indians are all over the world, as we know. Remittances are dropping this year during this crisis from the rich countries because of the recession, from the Gulf countries because of the crash in oil price. Immediately, it's not going to be a big problem on the current account this year because our current account, we suspect, will be in a surplus this year. It's a bad surplus, but a surplus nevertheless. So this year, even if remittances decline by about 25%, I believe the external sector, the balance of payments can cope with that. But if indeed decline in remittances becomes a structural problem, we will have a structural problem in our balance of payments. On whether it will become a structural problem, let me uh, reflect on that. I believe that Indian labor is going to be good value for money, even after this crisis. Uh, in the rest of the world, in the Gulf countries, in the rich world, India will still be, Indians will still be productive uh, in terms of uh, value for dollar. So I think that this uh, reduction or in-migration or reverse migration that's taken place over the last one year will uh, reverse itself and the Indians who are who come back will go back uh, to wherever there are opportunities. Of course, the price of oil has to go up if the Gulf countries have to take back Indians and recession has to be behind us if uh, Indians have to go back to the rich countries. And I think that those things will happen. I'm not as pessimistic on the remittance side as uh, I thought you were. Very comforting to hear you on that uh, particular aspect of remittances. Not bringing on to India as serious an impact as one might have expected it to have. Uh, if I could now uh, switch to Mr. Rai and slowly start uh, sharing with you uh, some of the questions that we have been uh, receiving uh, from the participants that we have had. And uh, one of the questions that uh, we have already had uh, shared on the forum is uh, this interesting question about why the government of India has refrained from underwriting credit risk. And uh, there, there's this question of the undercapitalized uh, banking sector, which Dr. Rao had alluded to, and the possibility of India establishing a bad bank for taking over the primary NPAs that a large number of banks continue to have. But uh, Mr. Rai, uh, do you think that there is uh, a possibility that the government of India might eventually be pushed into a situation as more and more layers of the COVID-19 implication unfold, that it might be forced to underwrite credit risk? 
uh, well, the uh, government has already taken steps to uh, give guarantee to loans which are being taken by MSME sectors. So to that extent, um, without security, they can borrow. Now, the bad bank issue, uh, well, it has been debated any number of times whether it's, uh, uh, it's a good idea, it's not a good idea. The issue about the bad bank was just this, that you hive off the stressed assets from the balance sheet of the banks and give it to a bad bank. Now, the, if the bad bank is in the public sector, it will suffer with the, all the ills of the public sector in terms of decision making or regarding valuation and at what price it, those assets are to be disposed of. If it was in the private sector, then the issues arise at what value the banks will be able to hide them off and give it to the a private entity to dispose of those assets. But stage is coming, time is coming when I guess government will have to uh, very seriously look at the fact whether a bad bank needs to be set off because the stress on the balance sheet of the banks does not seem to be reducing. And unless it is uh, 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 taken care of quickly, the decision-making process, the credit enhancement process will continue to suffer. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and, and that's why I feel that uh, uh, in terms of capitalizing banks, well, the fiscal space is limited, but to the extent that credit and lending enhances, government seems to be prepared to set apart more funds to be capitalized, uh, to capitalize the banks which are in the public sector space today with the, with the government taking steps to try and reduce the number of banks by merging. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Rai. Uh, Dr. Rao, if I could switch back to you again and uh, check with you your views on another question that has come up on the chat forum. Uh, a very interesting question. In fact, uh, when the Prime Minister of India in a couple of his uh, latest television addresses to the nation, uh, outlining the strategies on COVID actually has been more than once emphasizing on building self-reliance, uh, which in uh, uh, Hindi has been explained as Atma Nirbharata. Now, uh, what I wanted to check with you on is a very interesting counterfactual to this emphasis. Does this actually mean that India has decidedly, dedicatedly gone back to being inward. Does self-reliance now today in the current parlance and milieu that we are living in is, is basically a formal acceptance of the fact that India is going to look inward and justify it as an effort to build self-reliance? Do you think that's what the driving tone of the current economic narrative is? Like it's become the standard practice for this government, uh, they throw out terms, slogans, without fleshing them, so they leave it to us to interpret what that means. I cannot presumably speak for the Prime Minister what he meant by self-reliance, but I certainly hope that it is not self-sufficiency that uh, we were struggling with before the economic reforms in 1991. What I believe the Prime Minister meant, and what I hope he meant by self-reliance, is that uh, we will continue to maintain an open economy. We will not go back to production behind protectionist walls. This is not a question of promoting Indian-made products behind tariff barriers. This is an issue of keeping India open, keeping India open for trade, open for investment. At the same time, we will try to maximize our exports where we have a comparative advantage. We will not shun off, shy away from importing where we have no comparative advantage, but we will make sure that we will maximize our exports and minimize our imports. I believe that's what the Prime Minister meant by self-reliance and not self-sufficiency as we used to talk about. And I recall from his uh, 
National Address when he un, uh, released the Atmanirbhar package, he said also promote the India brand. Global vocal or something to that effect, he said. That uh, Indian businesses and Indian people must promote the India brand. I think the Prime Minister was very right to point it out. Because there are lots of misperceptions about the quality of products made in India. Make, made in India is not, at the moment, uh, a source of credibility about quality. Uh, made in India today is a source of questioning the quality of a product. So I think if you're going to be self-reliant, we've got to focus on quality of our products. The second thing we've got to do, if we've got to, and many things we've got to do, but that's just what comes to my mind as one of the two important things to do. One is product quality. The second is uh, make, make the investment experience a happy experience for investors. India has moved up in the World Bank's ease of doing business in the last six years, the Modi government has been in office from about 125 in 2014 to about 63 today. But anecdotal experience is still that entrepreneurs, investors are frustrated at the front end level when they go about making their investments. What that means is that the ease of doing business is not actually reflecting the difficulty of the continuing difficulty of doing business in India. And I believe for that, structural reforms that we know that spoken about, that you've spoken about, that I has done a lot of research on, those are very important. But equally important, I believe, are governance reforms. Uh, that the bureaucracy and the entire government missionary is uh, held accountable for delivering on good governance at the front end level so that India can get the domestic and foreign investment and make self-reliance a realistic opportunity for India. Thank you very much, Dr. Rao. In fact, we are... Uh hardly left with much time for this extremely fascinating and stimulating discussion but whatever few minutes that have uh, that that have been allotted to us now uh, before we end there are two questions which i wanted to check one with you and one with uh, mr rai so i'll i'll begin with you dr rao uh, there's a factor which is not being discussed much in the current macroeconomic context surrounding India. That is the role of the exchange rate. But in some context, the exchange rate is being alluded to by a group of people because you mentioned about the possibility of supply chains shifting out of China, there being a relocation of a variety of investments. But one probably needs to note the fact also that countries are free to play around with their exchange rates. And exchange rate can actually become a very important factor in judging the relative cost efficiencies across locations. What would be your perception of the Indian exchange rate in this regard? Do you think it's still overvalued? Can it depreciate? Does India need to really look closely at its exchange rate to think whether it can be utilized more effectively in the current situation. Uh, you got me there because uh, as governor, I've been tutored by my staff never to make a comment on exchange rate. I've been ex-governor for now seven years. I'm still quite uh, nervous about making a statement on exchange rate. But I must say in response to your question that uh, the stability of our external sector has been one of the silver linings in this very grim situation today. Our external sector has been stable because our exchange rate has been relatively stable. And the Reserve Bank has about $475 billion of foreign exchange reserves to buffer any volatility in the exchange rate. For sure, the rupee has depreciated by about 5 to 6% over the last uh, six months or five months since January. But rupee has depreciated less than currencies of our peer countries like South Africa, Mexico, Brazil, or Indonesia. So contrary to how you look at it, that the rupee is not depreciated enough, I would say that the rupee is not depreciated so much is in fact the positive of uh, our economy and our external sector. Of course, the rupee is overvalued. That's evident from the Reserve Bank numbers, overvalued by about 15 to 20%. 
whether the Reserve Bank will actively try to run down the total valuation by allowing the nominal exchange rate to depreciate. My own view is that uh, they would not bother about it too much right now uh, because uh, it's not out of the, out, it's not completely out of line with fundamentals and they will not want to open a new battlefront when they're already battling with the other domestic issues. And also, you mentioned about whether exchange rate can be a factor in improving competitive advantage. Yes, in general, yes, from macroeconomics, textbook economics, we know that your exchange rate is uh, undervalued, you have a competitive advantage. But research has shown that as far as India is concerned, our long-term export advantage is dependent more on the income levels in the destination countries of our exports rather than the exchange rate. In other words, India's export prospects are hurt more by the recession around the world today than by the nominal or real exchange rate. I'm not saying that it's completely irrelevant, but I'm, I'm, only, I'm only saying that uh, it is not the overriding priority at the moment. So the exchange rate is relatively stable. I believe that the Reserve Bank is quite comfortable with this. They might allow gradual depreciation to, to allow the rupee to find its level. But I don't believe that they're going to be very activist in the market at the moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. In fact, uh, that, that is probably the broad sense of the policy direction that continues to come out of the Reserve Bank of India in the pronouncements that it has made. Mr. Rai, if I could now turn to you with the last question that we have uh, with us for this session. Uh, one of the issues regarding COVID-19 in India has been this discussion about how institutions have performed. And when we refer to institutions, as Dr. Rao also alluded to, uh, the question of governance reforms remains very important. COVID has been a public health crisis with very strong economic ramifications. And we have seen these gray areas emerging between central governments and state governments with respect to distribution of food, with respect to transportation of the migrant labor back from where they were to where they wanted to go. Uh, there have been occasional uh, disruption in communication between the, the center and the state governments on the way the pandemic should be managed in terms of the nature of the testing to be implemented, so on and so forth. So in short, do, do you think that India's public institutions and public systems were found wanting in handling this crisis? Could they have performed better? And is it very important now as we go ahead along with other policies to also actually focus as emphatically as possible on the rough edges of the public systems that have been exposed and look to correcting them? Uh, at the time when the lockdown was ordered, to what extent the federalism between states and the central government to consultations took place is anybody's guess. And I don't think at that particular point of time, the states and the center were on the same page. Uh, neither of them had any idea of the magnitude of the problem that number one, migrations will bring about. Number two, the health infrastructure will require to face. And number three, the kind of food and containment policies that would, be, uh, would have to be catered for. Now, some of the states, of course, performed very well, considering the fact that the, their infrastructure was uh, in place, Kerala in particular, the southern states to a large extent. Uh, but I think what has got everybody by surprise was the amount, the number, the sheer numbers, because medical infrastructure, the containment infrastructure of the urban local bodies has been found to be totally insufficient. So whether it was Delhi, which was Mumbai, or the corporations of Karnataka or others, they, they have had very severe problems with them. And I think this will have to be a kind of a watershed, a flashpoint, 
where these public institutions will have to rethink their policies going forward. And uh, in terms of public associating themselves or cooperating with these institutions, I think we come heads up because the public by themselves have been able to provide for a huge amount of succor and help to face with the problems, whether it was medical, whether it was food supplies or whatever, or whatever it was. But uh, you are right in the sense that the, uh, the, the coordination, whether it was transportation, whether it was railways, whether it was moving of uh, special aircraft, there was a certain degree of dissonance between some of the institutions, state to state, state to center, center to state, and which needs to be tied up going forward. Thank you so much, Mr. Rai. In fact, it's uh, a bit, uh, I would say, ironical to look back at uh, India post COVID-19 and also to take note of the fact that not only has the crisis affected the country in the kind of proportions by which it has, but it, is, it has also been happening at the same time along with natural catastrophes which have hit India both on its coasts in terms of unprecedented cyclones and the damages that have done putting that much pressure on the preparedness and public systems. This has been a fascinating conversation and I would like to really deeply thank uh, both Dr. Subarao and Mr. Vinod Rai uh, for giving to us such valuable insights and thoughtful analysis on what otherwise is a very complex scenario in terms of what's going on in India with respect to COVID, the economic impact, and how India is able to, or will be able to come out of this at whatever point in time. What are the magnitude of challenges it faces in that regard? Thank you so much, sirs, for sharing your perspectives. Thank you, the audience, the participants, for turning up in such large numbers. I'm aware of the fact that uh, we have gone live on Facebook and there are a large number of viewers who have been uh, hearing us, watching us. Thank you for the questions that you have shared with us. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, I thank you all for being a part of this event. And we all look forward to from the Institute of having you with us again in our future events. Thank you so much. Good evening to all of you. Good afternoon to the rest from whichever part of the world, particularly India, that you have joined. I look forward to seeing you again. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.